Now, we are confirming once again that uh, the convergence intersection between law and technology is a nice thing to preach, but uh, difficult to put in practice, to practice, because at the moment we are not able, as it happens, to connect with Donatella uh, Solda-Kurzman, who would be the first speaker in the afternoon session. And uh, as this is the case, uh, we are order and uh, start with the presentation by Christiana Sapa from Turin, Turin University and also our project manager, who is going to look at selected copyright and related rights issues. Uh, where are we exactly this afternoon? Uh, this morning we have uh, looked at um, access and reuse, and then the intersection between privacy and uh, data protection. Is it a hurdle or it is not a hurdle to uh, exploitation of open data? This afternoon uh, we resume on the question of the obstacles, hurdles, difficulties in uh, the uh, reuse of public sector information. And we know that uh, IP may be such an obstacle. Uh, later on we'll see whether antitrust has uh, something to contribute to open up whatever IP is closing. So. Christiana is going to talk to us about uh, selected copyright and related rights issues, or one might also phrase it, IP and uh, public sector information. Okay, thank you. Um, so the presentation, uh, my presentation is going to be uh, a combination of the research result of my EVPSI work and considerations developed in uh, the LAPSI thematic network. Um, of course, the LAPSI thematic network is mainly uh, focusing on the exercise of intellectual property rights. I will leave them uh, for the very last few considerations, so I will focus on, on preliminary issues. This is why I, I'm telling you that um, I'm presenting both AVPSI and LAPSI um, approaches and studies. So this is the outline that I intend to follow. I intend to tell you what we are, to are we talking about, where do we want to go, how can we reach our objectives and what are the areas um, where the problems arise. What are we talking about? We're talking about two terms of comparison, PSI on one hand, what is PSI? Uh, Mark Rikofi and the other speakers presented it uh, in the, the morning session. Um, and and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a starting point. And on the other hand, we are talking about intellectual property rights, which means exclusive rights. What are exclusive rights? They are rights that have implications in terms of price determination, of course, as well. As well. Um, we are not uh, talking uh, about all intellectual property rights, but on copyright and related rights only, uh, like the sui generis protection of database, uh, which is considered an, uh, a related right for the purpose of this, this presentation. How intellectual property are linked to the public sector information? It's a fact. There are some data, public data, which are covered by intellectual property rights, often because the, the, the data were not created within the public sector bodies uh, or, to some extent, the public undertaking. Um, and, and why? Because in particular, in a continental perspective, the, um, the intellectual property rights are innate rights, natural born rights. So uh, the, 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 the works are covered by, by rights, um, by, by this kind of, of rights. Uh, what is the legal framework which is regulating uh, this area? Uh, of course we have norms on copyright and related rights and we also have some 
clauses in the directive uh, on public sector information. Uh, more precisely, I indicated all the clauses on intellectual property uh, contained in the directive on reuse, PSI reuse here in these two slides. I would say that the, the, all these clauses can, could be summed up by saying that there are three kinds of clauses on intellectual property rights in the directive uh, on PSA reuse and in the proposal of revision of the directive. The first group of rules is uh, determining the material scope of the directive. For instance, there, are, uh, there, there, is, a, there is a clause which is saying that the, um, the directive regime on PSA reuse is applying only when the PSI is not covered by intellectual property rights belonging to third party. Um, another kind of, of uh, another group of, of uh, clauses on intellectual property is referring to the rights, IP rights of employees. Um, and a third group, a third set of rules uh, on intellectual property rights is referring to the charging principles that may be uh, applied when there is um, an intellectual property right over public sector information. So, um, I think that it's the, the, the link between intellectual property and public sector information is very much close to what um, uh, Francesco uh, Pizzetti was saying this morning. It's, we, we have two um, interests. Uh, we, we have um, at least on one hand, on the end of a intellectual property, one fundamental interest to be secured, and as to the public sector information, we have some interests that are uh, more and more important. And both between these two kinds of interest, uh, there is a conflict, there is a tension. We have to find a compromise in order to realize, to implement both of, the, of these interests. And it, it, it is not easy, but it is really uh, this, this tension, this conflict is reflecting the, the, the current societies, the current needs and, uh, of the societies. Where do we want to go? So on one hand we want to enhance access and reuse of public sector information, but we also want to respect uh, intellectual property rights, exactly as other uh, existing protected interests. Uh, and and uh, if you look at the norms on, co on, yes, on copyright and, and uh, neighboring rights, you will see that there is a high protection for these kind of rights. Uh, so it is of, of particular importance, the respect, the, the respect of these intellectual property rights is of particular importance. Now, if, you, if we reason in a broader terms, we not only we want to enhance the reuse and protect the intellectual property, but we really want to create conditions for enabling economic growth and the related social growth, social development. By doing all the all these things I listed here, by fostering the market, in particular the internal market, by enabling transparency and accountability, avoiding extra costs to the public sector bodies, in particular in this historical moment, uh, by creating incentives, incentives for public sector bodies, and by respecting and enforcing fundamental rights and freedoms. Now, we can adopt an intellectual property right perspective and reading this, all this, in a IP, with the IP glasses. So we can foster the, inter, uh, the internal market by granting a high, uh, enforcing a high level of protection of works of art and other uh, cultural products. Um, we can uh, create incentive and avoid extra cost to public sector bodies by using intellectual property rights as uh, tools for self-financing mechanisms. And of course, we can respect and enforce fundamental rights by granting this, this high protection of intellectual property rights. On the other hand, if we wear the public sector information reuse glasses, we can foster the market by implement appropriately by implementing appropriately the, 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 the regime on PSI reuse, 
uh, which is also helpful for transparency and accountability, in particular if we are really able to realize an open data paradigm, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the thing is that for fostering the market, enhance reuse, um, enhance uh, accountability and transparency, what we have to do is, among all the other things, is really valorizing the PSI gold mine uh, or the PSI resources. Uh, the PSI, which is composed of all these different groups of data. Um, in in the, the, the slides that are coming now, I try to figure out, um, I try to think in an intellectual property rights perspective. Suppose that the, we really want to keep the information uh, closed and we want to exploit in a traditional way, in an exclusive way also, um, uh, not necessarily exclusive but, but definitely in traditional way, intellectual property rights and we want to use the intellectual property rights to self-finance the, the, to finance the public sector bodies. What would be the public sector body's perspective? Well, they, they should be happy uh, to, to charge the, the, the access and reuse of the works covered by intellectual property rights that they hold. The problem is that they are not happy very often because apart in a few cases um, they rarely, they hardly have all the rights uh, and very often they do not know which rights they are holding, on which exactly they are holding the rights. In, in some cases there, there, there's um, the, 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 the stuff is in the public domain so they are not happy nor sad because they, they, they just do not earn money um, uh, on, the, on the basis of intellectual property rights. So the overall feature is uh, not really enthusiastic for, for the public, in a public sector body's perspective. Now, as you can see there are quite many shades. There, there's, there are uh, sometimes some um, shy red or some colors, I added some colors with, which are between the red and the yellow because I, I would suppose that the public sector bodies are not completely unhappy but almost. And I will explain you uh, later why. Uh, okay, in the reusers' perspective, the reusers, supposing that the, the public sector information is closed and the public sector bodies really want to charge, the, uh, really want to exploit the intellectual property rights, the reusers would be quite sad because, for instance, suppose if a re that the reusers want to access and exploit the works collected in cultural institutions. They need to ask the authorization um, and, uh, and pay for it, uh, for, for the exploitations. Um, they, they, actually, in this case, they are really in trouble because no matter whether the public sector bodies or third parties are owning these, uh, the rights, the reusers are quite um, uh, embarrassed and in, uh, in difficulties. Um, finally, in a community perspective, the framework is not that um, suitable because it seems that there are very few areas where with a shy uh, green appearing. Why did I put this shy green? Because of course the public domain works and the mere information is supposed to be available and for free, but sometimes some other rights are intervening and the, the reusers are um, thinking that it's, it's part of intellectual property rights even if this, this, this protection is, is of another nature. And of course there are also some phenomena of copy fraud where public, some public sector bodies uh, claim some uh, IP that actually do not have. Um, so, um, I, I, I do not really think 
uh, that the that this is the best way to to go. Um, so in in a, if consider all this this very short uh, remarks, um, maybe we should try and. Uh, where the, the PSI reused the open data classes in order to see whether the um, wh whether we, we are more satisfied at the end of the day. Remember that our purpose is always to, uh, to, to foster the economic development and the social development and to valorize the public sector information. Goldmine. So how can we valorize the public sector information goldmine? Gold Maybe through these four keywords, openness, by opening data, uh, opening formats, licenses, and all the procedures. Everything, uh, not, maybe not everything, but most, uh, the more things are transparent, uh, the better it is for achieving um, the, the, the economic growth. Uh, standardization is the second um, keyword. I'm referring to technical standardization, so standardization of formats, um, and also to the to a procedural one. I'm also referring to a geographical standardization. Should the contracts, the licenses used in the different European countries or in the different countries uh, be standardized, it would be easier to understand. Uh, the, 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 the way uh, to go. Whenever it is not possible to reach standardization, it would be suitable to reach interoperability. And interoperability ha has, in particular, four meanings, technical, legal, semantic, and organizational. Uh, in particular, it seems pretty important to reach legal interoperability, and Federico will say a couple of words uh, on this tomorrow and the semantic interoperability. So in the different countries, European, hopefully, but also non-European country, the, 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 same, the translations of the same words should uh, bear exactly the same meaning. And all this should be sustainable, sustainable on the long term. So this, these keywords, of course, are referring not only to intellectual property rights, but they are of particular importance also for intellectual property rights. Now, consider where we want to go and how we want to go there. What are the issues? What are the problems to be solved? Where do we find the problems to solve? Um, I think that there are two main um, Areas or problems, uh, at least in the in the IP uh, section. Um, the first thing to do is the right clearance procedure. So to identify where there are rights, which kind of public, which public sector information is covered by uh, IP rights, who is owning the existing intellectual property rights, and um, how. Maybe these rights could be transferred to the public sector bodies for enabling reuse. Once we have done, once we arrive to 1C, we can start talking about the exercise of rights. How to manage the intellectual property rights? What is the best way to exercise the IP rights in order to achieve uh, this, this um, economic and social growth? And therefore, possibly, possibly in in, a, um, in an open data perspective. Now, if we talk about intellectual property rights, if we if we are dealing with right clearance, uh, we can identify three main hypotheses. So we basically can easily reuse public sector information and works which is which are not covered by intellectual property rights. We may easily reuse works covered by IP rights when the public sector bodies or, uh, that are making these works available hold the IP rights needed for their, their daily reuse. And we cannot easily reuse public sector information which is covered by intellectual property rights belonging to the third parties because the directive is saying this. So, <laughs> 
this is the um, this is what we are facing. We are facing uh, the, 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 the a gold mine, which is really a minefield. Why? Because there are some works which are in the uh, public domain, so it is easy to make them available and for, for reuses. There are some works for which we do not know uh, who is owning what, so it's difficult to, for the public sector bodies to make them available and for the reusers to exploit them. And there are definitely many works which uh, the third parties are owning the intellectual property rights, so they are beyond, they are excluded from the PSI regime of reuse. Let's start from the first uh, hypothesis. The first hypothesis was we can easily reuse public sector information which is not covered by intellectual property rights. Within this hypothesis we find mere information, in particular if it is not included into a protectable database in Europe at least, and the works in the public domain. What about official acts? Now, often national norms exclude copyright protection for official texts. Um, official acts are those acts closely related to the public sector body institutional mission. And official texts are just part of the official act, are the literary. We are referring to the literary works, uh, but not to all the works which can be uh, considered official acts of a public sector body. Why uh, national norms often exclude the copyright protection for these uh, official texts? Because of an international norms that we can uh, international norm that we can find in the uh, Bern Convention incorporated uh, in, in the TRIPS agreement, which is leaving the member state free to decide whether to give or not protection to the uh, to this kind of, of works. Um, at the European level, actually, we do not have a specific norms on this. We just have exceptions on the content, to the, as to the content of copyright, but not at, as to the subject matters, indeed. Um, now, um, the problem, what are the problems of, or implications that I, I want to discuss here with you? Um, what, what is, um, suppose that at the national level that you have an exception on official texts. Uh, shall we include official acts as well? All the other uh, works which are not, not literary works but are uh, within the notion of official acts. What is an official act? By the way, I try to give a, a definition but it, it is not very ex extremely clear. And in general, the norms, the national norms which are containing an exception to the protection are referring to an exception um, uh, uh, to, to the copyright protection, but not necessary to the neighboring right, uh, which means that at least in Europe, where we have um, the database protection, uh, should uh, we, we, we deem that um, the databases, which are uh, official acts, are falling within the exceptions or are they outside exceptions and so are they protected? Um, now, in, what can we do? I think that uh, we, we should, at the national level at least, it would be very important to, uh, to have, if not a single notion, at least a quite harmonized framework. General harmonization. Whenever there is a harmonization, the things are easier. Not necessarily easy, but at least easier. And it would be important to adopt a broad interpretation of um, of official um, text and official act. Um, why? Because if we adopt a broad interpretation of the norms, we can um, presume that official act are falling within the exceptions exactly as all the official uh, texts uh, according to a non-discrimination principle. And uh, this is quite uh, common, this is not surprising at least in a civil law countries, but um, 
praticamente. Uh, but of course we have to take into account that in, in the EU we have also common law countries and in addition to that, whenever we do not have uh, a very clear rule, whenever we can interpret a rule in, a different, in different ways, uh, you do not necessarily have legal uncertainty. Therefore, what was suggested within the LAPSI, uh, within the LAPSI discussion, um, we, we, we may think about an amendment of the PSI directive on sui generis protection of databases, or as we are trying to, to do it within the EV PSI research group, trying to suggest amendments of the copyright and national norms on the exclusion of specific official texts from the protection. Now, uh, the second hypothesis was the one where uh, we, we, we are wondering, uh, do public sector bodies always, uh, that, that whenever public sector bodies hold intellectual property rights, uh, this may be easy to enable reuse. So the next question is, uh, do public sector bodies always hold IP rights on the works of their employees and on the works they commission? Um, the, 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 the legal framework that we have to refer to uh, is composed of national rules. Uh, and, and often intellectual property rights are held by, by the public sector bodies, but not necessarily. And when the public sector bodies hold the IP rights, they do not necessarily hold them for the entire uh, term of protection. So the main question that we have to, answer, that, to ask is who is owning, owning what? And the implication of this question, uh, which has no clear answer, is uh, the, the, the absence of legal certainty and absence of harmonization. Uh, in particular, within the LAPSI uh, thematic network, we, we initially we, we said that it would be um, suitable to identify a general presumption um, stating that the public sector bodies are holding the economic intellectual property rights on the works of their employees and the works they commissioned for the broadest use and reuse and for the entire copyright term. Uh, however, this has to do with the right ownership principles and the contract interpretation, which is something related to the state sovereignty. And therefore, it is quite likely that uh, the, the states are reluctant for any, uh, on any interference on, on this. And uh, it is not obvious that the public sector bodies are ready to bear the related cost of the assignment. Um, the third hypothesis is the hypothesis which is beyond the, uh, the, the, the directive regime. It is about the public sector information covered by intellectual property rights belonging to third uh, parties. Uh, and the solution of, of all this has to be found in the copyright legal framework, in the, more precisely in the internal limits or external limits of the copyright uh, uh, content of protection. Now, as I was telling you, uh, as to the LAPSI, um, LAPSI is also working on the exercise of public of, uh, intellectual property rights uh, of um, hold uh, held by, by the public sector bodies. Um, in, in particular, these are all the questions that Marco Ricolfi asked uh, when he revised the draft. Uh, of the policy recommendations on, on uh, intellectual property. And um, we are working on it. Um, I think that many of the input that you can find in these questions uh, can be refound also in the, in the guidelines on licenses that the LAPSI is developing and in the discussion that will be held tomorrow. Um, I, so I, I'm, I'm still working, on, LAPSI is still working on the draft on uh, the policy recommendation on intellectual property and I'm still working on my research paper on, on this, this topic. If you have any remarks and questions, you're very welcome. Thanks. We really had an overlong talk uh, to begin with. This is uh, in some way compensating the fact that uh, we cannot connect with Donatella Solda-Kutzmann. Uh, 
But uh, in fact, uh, Paul Torremans was supposed to start at three o'clock. It's quarter to three. So, Paul, I'm sure that you're going to stick to your 20 minutes. Uh, Paul Torremans uh, is uh, uh, a member of the thematic network. He's teaching IP at the University of Nottingham and uh, has come to Torino for the last 15 years or so now. He's a uh, friend contributing his immense IP knowledge when we need it. Uh, and he's going to talk uh, about uh, IPRs and public sector information and he's going to talk for sure about Crown, Crown Copyright, which is a peculiar British institution, but also about something else. We'll see. Thank you, Marco. Um, yes, I'll, I will stick to my 20 minutes. I don't want to lose a friendship over that one. I think I'm going to be hopefully a bit shorter than 20 minutes. Um, and I'll do my best not to bore anyone in the audience who's not from this little island of ours, which we call Great Britain. Uh, Crown copyright is maybe a bit of a peculiar topic. Um, I don't intend to spend an awful lot of time on it. I'll just try to explain what it is and, and what purpose it served and serves. I think the two are very different. Uh, and maybe that brings me on to the other topic, uh, it, it says in the title, other delicate issues. Part of that is the idea that we are going to include in the directive libraries, museums and archives. We have a policy recommendation that's almost ready on that point, so I have to say a few words about that. And I think, bizarrely enough, the two topics have a relationship. So you won't hopefully find out in 20 minutes that I've spoken about two very different topics that have nothing to do with one another. I think the two are one way or another related. Anyway, that by way of introduction, there we go. Uh, Crown copyright. Maybe I should say I can't speak alone or solely about Crown copyright. We also have parliamentary copyright, we have copyright uh, for the Welsh Assembly, and we have um, the copyright for the Scottish Parliament. Uh, to put it simply, as Christiana explained, the Berne Convention leaves it up to member states whether or not to grant copyright in official acts. There is, for those of you who want to read that in there, even a suggestion that you may not want to grant copyright in those texts. In the United Kingdom, we didn't understand it that way. We've decided that everything is copyright. So, the basic principle is we're trying to make sure that whatever is official acts, and I will not talk about Welsh Assembly copyright and the Scottish Parliament, copyright parliamentary copyright, that's for bills that are pending in the Parliament, to put it shortly. The idea is that any official act, the copyright goes technically to the monarch, goes to the country. There's an official copyright in it. And there are certain special rules. I think the, the basic idea behind this is that we want to control. If you make sure you have copyright, you can then license. And you can license with full control. You can enforce your right because you have it. That, that's the basic idea. I think originally, Graham will correct me if I, I get this wrong, but I think historically the idea was we want to charge for this copyright. We have a certain things in maps and other things, and, and we want to license. There are a number of cases uh, that are now bit outdated, but in a sense, the idea was you could charge. So that's, as I said in my introduction, was. That's the historic part. We have full control, and we can, on a commercial basis, exercise these rights. That's no longer the case, but we still have the copyright. So I think what we retain is the idea that we control. We can license. We'll see in a second how that uh, turns out, where that goes. Um, if I can introduce you very briefly to section 163 of our Copyright Act, that gives you an idea where this is, is coming from. It says, where a work is made by Her Majesty or by an officer or servant of the Crown in the course of his duties, the work qualifies for copyright protection, notwithstanding the ordinary requirements for, for copyright. Of course, you have to meet these, and Her Majesty is the first owner of any copyright in the work. Copyright in such a work is referred to in this part as Crown Copyright. 
That's the basic idea. So if you go from there, it's clear in principle that such works will attract copyrights and they come within the normal copyright rules. There are a few specific uh, provisions and it's always things that are done in the course of duty. Now, a first rule that's specific affects literary, dramatic, musical and artistic works. Surprisingly enough, a term of copyright protection is given of 125 years from the end of the calendar year in which the work is made. I should, before you start shouting at me saying 70 years post mortem autoris was bad, 125 is worse if it's not published commercially. If there is a commercial publication within uh, the first 75 years, it's 50 years. So you can still get to 125 years, but 50 years sounds much more reasonable than uh, the 125. Um, and the normal idea of commercial publication applies, so issuing copies to the public, that's basically the idea. The normal rule uh, applies. Then there's special rules if you want for Acts of Parliament, measures of the General Synod of the Church of England and so forth. There are a number of, and there's copyright in parliamentary bills which lapses when the bill is passed. So then it becomes free, but whilst it is there, the idea is, is very simple. Why do you want to control it only when the bill is pending, not when it's legislation? Well, you only want to give Parliament the right to control the bill, i.e. no misrepresentation, no uh, half copying and, and so forth. So that's the kind of idea you get. Now, since 1999, definitely in the white paper, we moved from the idea that everything is there for commercial exploitation and we want to make money. Before that, the cases came later, but on the old legislation we had plenty of cases where people borrowed maps, for example, from Ordnance Survey and clearly without paying for it you didn't escape, you got sued for it. As of the white paper in 1999, there's the idea that this copyright may still exist, but it will be waived. And that from there onwards, you, you know, we can authorize you to use the data, to use the uh, information. We still have the copyright, but we'll waive it. We moved on from there in a number of stages to the current open government license. The open government license simply means that if you want to take advantage of the data, you are deemed to have accepted a license. A license which has a number of things which, after having listened to the papers this morning, should sound familiar to you. There are, first of all, well, there's a first clause that I think is fairly reasonable. You should, well, reasonable, in, in, in this logic, maybe it's in practice not such a good idea, but anyway. The first logical clause is you have to acknowledge the source. If you got the data from the government, you have to acknowledge that as a source. Maybe a bad idea in the sense that it implicates certain liability for the data on behalf of the government. Um, in a second stage, you cannot suggest that whatever you do with it, whatever product you derive from it, somehow has the same official status. So you, you have to make it clear that this is your reuse if you want, this is not the official uh, data. You cannot, you accept not to mislead the third parties, I think to overlap to a fair extent, and anything in terms of data protection you have to take on board as well. So in that sense, the, the license automatically copies whatever data protection measures may have uh, applied. So from that perspective we've moved clearly to a situation in Crown Copyright where you can reuse. We want people to go to the portal, we want people to reuse the information, but we do it on a basis that we have the right and we license it. It's an automatic license, there's uh, no, no formalities of any real sort involved, but that's the kind of approach we take, licensing. For a UK copyright lawyer it sounds logical. We do the same with exceptions and limitations, we prefer licenses. Now how does that link in with libraries, museums and archives? Well I think it links in because in my view there are a couple of fundamental differences between the standard situation in relation to libraries, archives and museums 
and the one we see normally when it comes to reuse of public sector information data. I think the standard situation you find is one where, as it were, what is the data that are being reused, the information that is made available, is almost a side product. It's something that the authority generates, needs for its own activity, and someone else is now going to use it for another purpose, to add value to it. In relation to what we're talking about here, that kind of scenario is a minority scenario. Yes, I may draw a catalogue, I may have information about what I have in my collection. The real thing we are interested here, the real thing that is of value, is what do I have? Photographs of the sculptures in my collection, digital copies of the books in my library. What I would suggest to you, and what is a, in our view a fundamental difference, is that we're talking here intellectual property-wise. This is not a side product. This is the core business of libraries, museums, and archives. And I think that justifies a special treatment. I am not suggesting in any way that it should not be included in the new directive. I'm simply saying, if it is given special treatment, it's, in our view, not because, well, these people were not in there in order to get a political compromise and get them in. We need to give them something. I think it depends on the nature of the animal. It depends on the fact that it is their core business. There is another problem. And the problem is about money. Um, marginal costs, I think for libraries and museums and archives would be a pretty bad idea. I mean, the current proposal says you can charge above marginal cost. I think that's absolutely vital. What we really want these people to do is to make their collections, which are often not digital, we want to make them available in digital format. We want them to perform, to give us access to the material. To cover that cost, it is absolutely vital that you have some revenues, that you, you can fund that. It's also absolutely vital that you recognize that in many of these collections, there are works that are owned by third parties. It makes very little sense to simply say, let's abolish that because reuse has to apply to them since it is their core business. It may be a problem, it may be an eyesore for other areas. If it's the core business, well, let's just abolish it. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it particularly doesn't make sense if you look at the fact that there is an important business going on of public-private partnerships in digitizing works. I don't think that we can happily expect private parties without anything to just invest in this. The free investment, I think, has to a large extent already come and gone. They have cherry-picked the very interesting, lucrative parts of the collections. These have been digitized. If you want the whole collection to be digitized, in a sense, in part of reuse of data, what we really need is a complete set of data. In order to achieve that, somehow there has to be investment. If we accept that what is generated in terms of photographs, in terms of databases, may attract its own intellectual property right, abolishing that, doing away with that is not a good idea. On the other hand, I think what was not in the proposal that was originally in front of us, but what we understand, um, it may already have come and gone, but what we understood the Danish presidency proposed at a certain stage was to say that if you have a public-private partnership, maybe you want to give them seven years of exclusivity. And you want to make sure that after the seven years, things go back into the public domain. In a sense, you limit the exclusivity which you can give, you can have that partnership, you can have the intellectual property right, and your private partner can get some form of exclusivity, but only for a limited period. It strikes us that that's a sensible way of having a compromise. Now, the one thing that I think comes out of this is that there is one important issue, a delicate issue when it comes to European policy making. It's all very nice to say in this directive that we don't touch on intellectual property, we don't touch on copyright. It's even nicer to say 
we have a somewhat wide definition of what third-party copyright involves. If in, in the original work that goes into the collection there was a third-party copyright, that's also covered. It still is third-party copyright. It strikes me that we've come to a point where that doesn't make, that's not good enough anymore. We need somehow to solve in terms of those areas which we want to bring into the directive and where intellectual property is their core business, where their core rights, their core collection is covered by intellectual property. On the one hand, we need to respect the rights. On the other hand, we need a mechanism to make licensing smooth and easy. We need somehow to address things like the way we're addressing things in the Orphan Works draft directive. We need a mechanism where it is clear that when a work enters a collection, there has to be a clear picture as to who owns which rights, what is being licensed, and what can be licensed by the museum, by the archive, to other parties. We need somehow a mechanism there. We need to address that. So that, that's one thing. I think if something comes out of our uh, policy recommendation, it is that, especially when it comes to libraries and archives, intellectual property is a core issue and it, it's just not possible anymore for the future to simply say sorry it's other people it's another area we can't deal with it we respect it i think that's where the problem lies we need to do something uh, about that that that's a core issue and it's it's a massive problem rather than a minor problem the, the second thing that comes out of our uh, analysis is that yes having rights Respecting rights is a good idea, but in the same sense as we do it in the UK with Crown Copyright. To be able to license. That's why I said you need to enable that, make that easier. You need to clarify the lines of who owns what. You need to clarify who can license on whose behalf and how you can do that. Uh, that may work. The third bit, which we thought is an absolutely vital point, are these public-private partnerships and the idea of giving them some form of exclusivity but for a limited period. Avoid that through that construction you lock up everything. In a sense what you and I want to reuse is not the original sculpture to put it bluntly. We want the digital photograph, we want the metadata about it. If you grant exclusive rights in those metadata you lock these up again. That's the danger. There you need some kind of a system where those, uh, there's limited exclusivity but they are made available. So on, on that basis, I think there are three points there which we think are vital. If we don't pay attention to that, I think what we've done by including libraries, museums, and archives may be seen by history as a minute, very little step forwards that's almost irrelevant. Because we are going to include very, very few things in practice. Most things are going to be excluded in the exceptions. That cannot be the purpose. There is no justification for that. But we need to work on these three points. Thank you very much. Before I open the debate, uh, uh, let me remark that uh, when we started our thematic network, IP lawyers were the majority of the people involved, uh, just because it was uh, the Nexus Center and myself, which were uh, asking partners to come in, to come on board, <coughs> majority. There were, of course, people dealing with administrative law with other areas, but we were a majority. At some point, we seem to have realized that the really exciting stuff was uh, other stuff, access and abuse, privacy, and so on. And so we left it at the end, and now we are coming to grips with the IP issues in the ways which have been uh, discussed uh, here. And the other thing I wanted to say about this, uh, which was very interesting uh, in my experience, is that uh, uh, when uh, European legislation is being discussed, uh, there are novel ways to give uh, input uh, and contribution which are not only to uh, go to a hearing at the European Parliament or to do lobbying and the like. Um, we have been contributing as a Nexus Center uh, 
to uh, the legislative uh, process because uh, also the regions are being asked to give their uh, feedback on uh, the proposals. And this is one of the issues on which uh, we have tried uh, to uh, deal uh, with uh, uh, the problems which may arise uh, by the fact uh, that um, public sector bodies are contracting out uh, work which may turn out to be protectable, how to make sure that uh, this work is, if IP protected, in the hands not of the contractor, the third party contractor, but by the administration. And then when you have more layers of IP protection, meaning copyright and the database right, they may overlap, but they should not uh, make more complicated licensing. So this is the kind of stuff on which uh, we have been uh, preparing proposals. So it's still a very broad area indeed, uh, this one of um, IP and uh, public sector information. And uh, we are a bit, but not too much late, and we have time to take uh, questions. So thank you Paul for an excellent presentation there and uh, I want to pick up on some of your points around uh, the money, around funding and I think around sustainability. Um, how are we going to make this transition to creating that digital culture? How do we build into our legal framework the ability to, to be able to charge for stuff? but enable it to be more widely shared. So, I think that's my first. Does this work? No. Okay, this should, should be better. Um, I think personally, I... I share a number of the worries about sustainability and about funding. Um, I think there is a very simple truth. The simple truth is that if the data are being produced anyway, and they are being supplied as they are there, as a side product, then I have absolutely no worries with the idea that it should be done at marginal cost, uh, almost free of charge. I think there are a number of areas, libraries, museums and archives that strikes me are a typical example where that logic doesn't work for a number of reasons. It doesn't work for the reason that what, you, what people are interested in is not just the list of members of staff, the uh, financial data of how you run a museum or uh, an archive, they want more. They want the institution to generate data about their collections, what they have, uh, what is in their basements, and so forth. They want digital pictures, digital versions of old books, manuscripts, things that are, um, well, let's be honest, if, as a researcher, if I need a very old book that's rarely held in libraries, I prefer not to have to travel for a few thousand kilometers to go to a library and access it. If I can get it online in a digital version, that's much easier. But that then touches upon the core operational issues of such institutions. It's not a side effect. It's not things that are there. You need to generate them. And there I think, and, and of course, if you generate these things, I don't see why, if we have intellectual property rights in, say, photographs and so forth, I don't see why a museum should then not be able to benefit from it. We are not prepared to publicly fund that kind of operation. So if you have a private partner involved, they want somehow to see a return on this. They want some kind of exclusivity. How do you do it by way of intellectual property? So I think there we need a model, first of all, that respects intellectual property rights as a way to control as a way to charge, maybe with limited exclusivity and with a clear model of licensing, but I think we need to allow them to charge above marginal cost for that purpose. I think that's also what was in the original group. 
proposal. I think that makes perfect sense. I do think personally that that's just outside the topic of, of my paper. Um, just by way of indication, I think there are areas in between. It's not just libraries, museums and archives. There may be other scenarios where somehow it's not a side product that's there. It's not a minimal effort in, in selecting, purifying, making available data in the right format, machine readable form. There may be higher cost in certain areas. And I think there we need to be flexible. I understand that's also the discussion that member states are having as to what we want to do in charging. I agree with you, it's going to be a very delicate transition. Uh, the problem is we're dealing with a very, very diverse field and applying one rule to all simply doesn't work. But if we're doing unpredictable things, who knows what comes out of this in terms of reuse, then drafting diverse rules in advance is equally a massive uh, and very difficult task. But I think we need to do it. Thank you, Paul. Let me say a few words of caution. Of caution, sorry, sorry about public-private partnerships. Luis would uh, remember this. Uh, we had discussions in uh, the high-level group on, digi on the Digital Libraries Initiative. Well, probably to start uh, with uh, the issue, uh, Paul is right uh, that uh, this is a phenomenon which has come and gone. There has been some cherry-picking of the real interesting stuff. Uh, I don't see money pouring in from Google, Microsoft or Facebook to digitize anything right now. This has been maybe six or seven years ago, but no longer. But this is not my objection. My objection is that um, uh, public-private uh, partnerships uh, are just the opposite of the idea, no strings attached. That the money may flow in, but at conditions which are very heavy and very dangerous, have to be dealt with carefully. Um, incidentally, the Digital Libraries Initiative had uh, a subgroup headed by uh, Mrs. Brindley, uh, who is the head of the British Library, which dealt with public-private partnership, detailing what were the benefits, but also the costs and the dangers entailed by public and private partnerships. One has been mentioned, which is exclusivity. And in this connection, I would say that exclusivity, seven years is really a lot if we think about the speed with which stuff is moving. Antitrust, uh, when it's uh, allowing for a non-competition clauses, as the Nutritia case has said, five years is the limit, so I don't really see how seven years is reasonable. But on top of this, we should remember that uh, in any digitization process, there are other items which may be copyrightable. Let me start from metadata. And if uh, the content is uh, in the public domain, but the metadata are not, this means that the content is not really uh, reusable or searchable. And then digitization may imply uh, added value of some kind, uh, like when you repage, we, you relocate the stuff, uh, which in some jurisdiction is copyrightable itself. Uh, plus, these contracts uh, with uh, PN, public and private, uh, with private partnerships, uh, are hundreds of pages. At some point, you'll find, uh, like in the Google Books draft agreement clauses, saying. Uh, that uh, the digitizer's content is available for uh, end users, but uh, information mining and big data technology cannot be uh, implemented on these uh, trove, uh, which means that contractually you introduce restrictions which are um, disabling technological advances. So I would say, Okay, I can see the point which has been uh, substantiated by Paul Torremans that if we wish to have other stuff available, a marginal cost charging policy may be a bit of a contradiction. But before we get into private money, be very, very sure, get advice of very good lawyers, otherwise you'll find uh, that you have uh, stuff which was 
in the public domain to begin with and is no longer in the public domain at the end of the process. Maybe you wish to comment on this. I think, um, I think there's people in the audience, Federico, for example, who may know more about this. I haven't seen what the Danish presidency proposed, literally. I haven't seen the, the, the real wording. My understanding was that they had a clause in there that after seven years, everything went back and also the metadata and everything. So it was really, the idea was we give you a somewhat long period of seven years. They got immediately apparently the comment that we needed more than seven. Uh, ten was mentioned, but okay, that, that's a normal bargaining process. But the compromise seemed to be that if you want to do this in a public-private partnership, after a number of years, the whole thing, whatever else you've generated, comes back. In that sense, that might be a way of avoiding a number of these uh, negative consequences. I think that the one thing that, uh, I mean, I share Marco's views on uh, the risks involved. I, I have no doubt about these. Um, what I also have no doubts about is that if we don't generate somehow money from a private source, our public finances will simply mean that it's not done. There will be nothing. And then we have to think whether we can provide a structure that allows us to have it on the one hand at a cost which remains acceptable. Whether seven years is too little or too much if you get it all back afterwards, that's a discussion we can have and we can see what's available. Okay. Uh, I suggest we have our coffee break now and resume uh, punctually for, for once at uh, 15.55, which is in 10 minutes time.